Good day, everyone. This is Chris Janis. I'm the Director of Communications at the National Association for Business Economics. I will please present today's event. Uh, before we turn to the topic, uh, I want to draw your attention to a few upcoming webinars. Uh, so in the wake of COVID-19 outbreak, uh, NAB is really committed to getting good information out on these developments. Um, we have scheduled several uh, webinars over the next few weeks. Um, we really encourage you to spread the word on these events. Uh, you can forward them on through your networks. Uh, we dropped a link uh, to the events page on NAB.com uh, on the webinar screen. Um, yeah, you spread these words, uh, spread the word out to your networks, and just as a reminder, these events are all free for the public as well as NAB members. Uh, we will um, have a small business uh, outlook uh, tomorrow on uh, the coronavirus shock in small businesses, um, firm preparedness impacts and policy responses. Uh, we will uh, take a look at China on Thursday, the China economic update in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, next week, we have our Outlook survey release on Monday, March 23rd. We will host a teleconference uh, for NAID members in the media at 3 p.m. on March 23rd. Uh, and then we will have a, the U.S. fiscal policy responses to address the labor market consequences uh, of the coronavirus on March 24th. Um, we will take a manufacturing angle on March 25th, the COVID-19 uh, impact on manufacturing and supply chains. And then we have an energy roundtable webinar scheduled for March 31st, uh, taking a look at the impact on the global oil market. Um, I also did want to remind you that we have recently uh, relaunched our econjobs.org job board. Um, uh, we have new privacy controls and usability features. You can head over to econjobs.org to find your next job or to post open jobs at your firm. Okay, and now on to today's events. Uh, we will be um, recording today's event, and it will be available later today on the made.com podcast page. Uh, there will be no slides for today's event. Uh, the webinar will include a question and answer period after the presentations. However, if you have a question at any time, you could submit it uh, during today's event. Just type your question into the box on the left side of the window and then click on Send. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event, uh, former MAID President Stuart McIntosh with the Group of 30. Stuart, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, moderate this, uh, this uh, webinar. As you know, NABE is the uh, voice of business economics in America and globally, and we're very pleased to do this series of uh, webinars on COVID-19. And before I start, I want to say I hope that very many people online will uh, stay well and safe, uh, keep your social distance, and keep washing your hands. As you know, we're in an unprecedented uh, situation at the moment. We haven't seen anything like it from a medical perspective for at least 100 years since the 1917 pandemic. We have hundreds of millions of people across the world uh, rest, uh, staying in their homes uh, from Spain to France to Italy to the UK, UK and the US with the European borders closed. And we undeniably have an economic impact potentially greater uh, than we saw in the, in the global financial crisis in 2008. There seems to be increasing consensus that that's what we're facing. It's therefore very important and appropriate that we have a, a webinar today to discuss the global monetary policy update and the outlook of mid-COVID-19. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined by my two speakers. They will both speak uh, for seven to ten minutes, and then we'll take questions. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined by Julia Coronado, who is the founder and president of Macro Policy Perspectives, LLC. Julia will talk on the U.S. aspects of monetary policy response to this uh, medical pandemic. And uh, Megan Green, who is senior fellow at the Mossava Ramani Center for Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School, who will address international aspects. So without further ado, let me hand over to Julia. Julia, please. Thank you, Stuart, and uh, thanks to everybody for dialing in. Um, so I'm going to sort of touch on what the Fed has done and why. Um, I'm going to hit the points at a high level uh, and, and sort of guide, give some guidance at least on what um, I'm expecting and my team is expecting uh, going forward. So 
a little bit of background on how um, events have unfolded in the last couple of weeks. Um, so, I mean, the, the fundamental issue of the coronavirus and the associated shutdown and quarantining and social distancing um, implies an extremely broad-based interruption in economic activity and, um, and, and almost a hard stop in, in the discretionary sectors of the economy. Um, so anything to do with restaurant spending, travel, uh, entertainment, you know, we can think of these things combined. The, the employment in these industries accounts for almost a third of total employment. So um, that's the magnitude of, of the impact, which is enormous, and it's happening at a speed that we've never seen really before. So normally when we go into re a recession, there may be uh, a, a, an event developing in a particular sector, and then it sort of broadens out to hit uh, consumer and business psychology. Um, this, is, this is a sort of externally imposed hard stop on the economy. And so it has a, a different dimensions in terms of how it's been feeding into markets and how it's been affecting policy and how it will affect policy going forward. So in terms of the market, um, what we saw was a, the confluence of a number of events effectively shut down some of the markets, including even the Treasury market last week, which was something we didn't even see in 2008. So what were those factors? You know, because of the associated um, interruption in revenue, virtually every uh, corporation and uh, mid-sized business with a credit line at a bank was tapping that credit line so that they would have cash in hand to weather the coming revenue shock. Um, and so that led to an immediate expansion um, of bank balance sheets and a pullback in other areas um, of their activity. So we saw a pullback in market-making activity and risk tolerance um, by the big banks at a time when there was so much fundamental uncertainty and a lot of repricing uh, in markets generally. So you're sort of compounding a repricing based on a real economic event with a lack of liquidity in market making um, from, from the, from the market making community. So that exacerbated um, things. At the same time, these very institutions were also being disrupted logistically. There was a lot of um, trading moving from trading floors to homes. And we heard from a number of people that that was complicating market making. There was mixed reports of some of the electronic trading not working, and that's the vast majority of the treasury market and some of the mortgage market now anyway. Um, so there was a tremendous amount of disruption as well um, to, in addition to the reduction in, in risk budgets that just added to um, a lot of uncertainty and sort of volatility and uncertainty tend to compound and feed on it on itself uh, in, in market dynamics. So we saw that just escalate incredibly rapidly last week. So again, starting with emerging markets and credit markets uh, and then moving into the mortgage market and then by midweek it was in the treasury market where um, you know, there's, there's different tiers of security, some of which are less liquid, some of which are very liquid, and even the most liquid treasury securities were having a hard time trading by Wednesday of last week. Um, the Treasury market is the benchmark, it, or the benchmark for, for global markets. Um, if it stops functioning or becomes less liquid, that's going to compound through a reduction in risk appetite globally very, very quickly. So the Fed moved quickly last week to increase uh, repo capacity and to spread its uh, Treasury purchases that had already been agreed to and had they had planned on them being temporary um, and were concentrated in the short end of the Treasury curve. They started spreading them out of, across the curve last um, uh, Thursday and Friday, pulling forward the purchases, spreading them through across the maturity spectrum as a signal to market that they would be there. Um, and then, of course, we saw them pull forward uh, the, the FOMC meeting to the weekend and give us a Sunday morning announcement. And at this stage, the Fed is now acting on all fronts 
in its toolkit. Every tool in its toolkit is being activated. So uh, from a monetary policy standpoint, they cut rates to zero, uh, and they gave us forward guidance that they will hold rates at zero uh, until they are confident that the economy has weathered recent events and is on track to achieve their mandate. Uh, so that forward guidance, that, that's straight out of the playbook that says when you're this close to the zero lower bound and you have limited ammunition, you don't wait till things get bad and you don't wait till the data comes in. Uh, you, uh, you, you act quickly and decisively and you don't, you know, hold back ammunition. So that's exactly what they did. They cut um, rates aggressively. They gave us forward guidance that is tied to the economy. Uh, tied to economic outcomes, which again is sort of best practices now uh, in in terms of providing forward guidance. In addition, uh, they gave us a, a, a pretty large tranche of quantitative easing. So um, while they had been buying $60 billion a month in treasuries just to sort of build up reserves and liquidity, and they were expecting to phase that out over Q2, they announced 500 billion in treasury purchases, 200 billion in mortgage securities to uh, to take place over the coming months. So they didn't give us a fixed schedule. They wanted to retain some discretion in, in how much and how soon those um, purchases were needed. And you know, in the Sunday evening press conference, Powell hesitated to you know put the QE label on it. Um, so it has kind of a dual purpose. QE was um, in the later stages a monetary policy um, action taken to support financial conditions and economic activity. That was the phrasing the Fed used to use. This is the primary purpose is to support the flow of credit to the to the real economy, to businesses and households, and the smooth functioning of markets. But Powell also indicated, of course, it's also to support the economy. So it seems to be we're moving from just monetary policy into kind of a blend of lender of last resort plus monetary policy as a motivation for this QE program. And again, it's open-ended. They can and will do more if needed. It can last longer if needed. Um, so again, what one lesson learned from, from 2008 and 9 in the global financial crisis is make your policy dependent on the desired outcomes, not on a, on a fixed window. Um, and so that's uh, what they did. Now the next set of actions is more we're moving into the lender of last resort function of monetary policy. So the, another action that they took was dollar swap lines, uh, which they have had. They've maintained the dollar swap lines, which were established in the global financial crisis. And they acted in concert with the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, the ECB, the Swiss National Bank, and the Bank of Japan, lowering the dollar, uh, the, the, the rate on the dollar swap line by 25 basis points, um, and extending the maturities from one week to 84 days. We have seen extreme stress in global dollar funding markets, and we still have them. Some of the first auctions of these dollar swap lines are going to take place tomorrow, so we'll see if that liquidity starts to ease. But we've seen um, a lot of indications, including the strength of the dollar, particularly against emerging markets, really um, show signs of stress. So that's, again, you know, the, the dollar is the global reserve currency, um, and the benchmark, and so if, if that can have tremendous ripple effects through the global economy if you don't um, ensure availability of dollar funding. So that was uh, the action taken with the dollar swap lines. Again, um, the announcement itself wasn't enough. We're still seeing lots of stress, uh, but uh, we'll see how this goes as the auctions proceed and the dollars get out the door. Um, the other action, there was sort of a range of actions taken with regard to banks. Uh, so they eliminated the penalty rate on the discount window, which is normally 50 basis points for a bank that is, finds itself in distress needing emergency funding. 
They can go to the Fed uh, with a penalty rate of 50 basis points above the, the current Fed funds rate. Um, they can get funding against a broad range of, by posting a broad range of collateral, including whole loans, small business loans, municipal bonds, whatever they have on their books, they can take it to the Fed. The Fed will apply a haircut and extend funding. So it's, it's, it's always there as a lender of last resort function, but the Fed wants this to be used broadly. So they're incur they cut the penalty rate, so it's now the top of the Fed funds range, um, and they've extended the maturity from overnight to 90 days. So term funding, this is a substantial easing in the terms for the discount window. They didn't go last time, so with the discount window, there can be a stigma associated with an individual institution tapping the discount window. Uh, and so they, um, uh, last time in 2008, they addressed that by doing, initiating something called the term auction facility. So instead of um, bank by bank going to the discount window and getting funding, they would auction off the funds, and they would sort of lean on the banks to participate uh, to eliminate the stigma. And it, re and it really did resolve that, and, and, and it worked. They didn't do that this time. They may still do that if they don't get the de de desired take up in the discount window. They did lean on the banks to sort of make public announcements that they're tapping the discount window. Uh, but they really want to make sure that this is not a, 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 a uh, a sign of stress right now. This is we want everybody to take as much as they want, uh, and this is again just for banks and depository institutions. Um, so they also then took a number of, of steps on the on the supervisory front. Uh, so they encouraged banks to use um, existing liquidity and capital buffers uh, and to ease some of the lending terms uh, to ensure that we we don't. Um, exacerbate this uh, challenging situation, which is going to, without a doubt, be a pullback, a reduction, a decline in activity um, into a much deeper and longer lasting recession by having it become a credit crunch. Uh, so they eliminated reserve requirements, encouraged banks to tap into their liquidity buffers. A lot of that is symbolic at this point. You know, again, banks are going to already see some take up from you know, uh, companies tapping their credit lines. There is, I think, more that can be done on the supervisory front. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One thing that the Fed may have to get creative about, you know, for example, we've seen in, in France and, and, uh, and Italy, and I'll, I, I won't go into depth into this because Megan's going to talk about the global situation. We've seen them uh, sort of suspend loan payments during for a window of time, say a three-month window. Um, that would be a, an incredible easing for households. That would be a very immediate way to ease cash crunches on households and businesses. Um, we've seen the Treasury today announce that they're going to suspend tax payments. Um, if the Fed could work with banks and maybe provide funding through the, the mortgage agencies to facilitate that in the U.S., I think that would be, in the current circumstances, a very meaningful way to support the economy because you don't want a global pandemic, which is not anybody's fault, to turn into a credit deterioration event for firms and households. And I think that needs to be the overriding objective. I think they fully understand that. That's how they're behaving. I think we're going to need more and more creative actions on that front to encourage banks, which are the conduits, to ease up on households and give some forbearance on households and businesses uh, in coming months, in addition to anything we see on the fiscal front. So we'll see how creative they get. Um, finally, the last front of action that they took today was initiating 13.3. So Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act allows them to take action in, quote, unusual and exigent circumstances. Um, can't think of a better description for the current environment. Uh, and so uh, they announced the establishment of a commercial paper facility. So commercial paper being short-term loans issued by you know, non-financial and financial companies. This is a you know, routine source of liquidity for companies. There is 
1.1 trillion in commercial paper outstanding. The commercial paper market, like other markets, was seeing a lot of distress because of sort of that credit uh, quality concern. Will banks, will companies be able to pay it back? Um, the buyers of this are mostly mutual funds and other um, investors that provide liquidity, daily liquidity for their customers. So, you know, that kind of worry can cascade very quickly through the system. So they established the facility today. Um, they got a first loss capital buffer from the Treasury. Uh, and, you know, now that we are in an unusual and exigent circumstances, there is possibilities for other things that they can do on this front. Uh, 13.3 allows the Fed to lend at any non-depository. Um, Dodd-Frank did put some restrictions on the Fed in terms of them not being able to lend to individual firms like they did with AIG and Citigroup and others uh, in the crisis. The, the law now has to be that it's got to be five companies, at least five counterparties in any given facility. But let's say they created a, you know, uh, 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 hospitality and airline facility. Um, you know, that certainly would have more than five companies. Uh, they, could, they could provide liquidity against good collateral for existing companies to get them through this period. That would be absolutely one option. Small business loans, um, even possibly some things that they can do on the municipal uh, bond front with um, municipal, uh, you know, state and local governments really being the front line of this uh, and needing money to um, fund the operations that will uh, address the health crisis. There is scope for the Fed to provide funding through a facility for that. Again, there would need to be some capital provided by the Treasury, possibly some at least implicit buy-in, acknowledged buy-in, or support from Congress, um, although it's not techni technically legally necessary. Uh, but there was a big backlash in 2008 with the Fed's creativity, so they presumably want to. I don't think any of those political barriers are going to stop them from doing this. A lot of the um, hurdles now are logistics, dealing with contracts and board reviews and the required sort of procedural um, steps that are necessary to, um, to, to establish these kinds of funding facilities. But I expect that we will see more on this front. Um, there's a common theme that the monetary policy is out of bullets. Um, it certainly isn't when it comes to extending uh, credit and funding and effectively printing money in a crisis. And the Congress can take steps to ease um, constraints on what they can do. Uh, so I think that is the nature of this crisis. So actually, I think monetary policy in conjunction with the Treasury uh, and, the, and, and the Congress can and will do a lot more to address what is uh, effectively a liquidity crisis or a liquidity crunch in the real economy. So I think it will take both fiscal and monetary policy, the checks they're talking about to consumers are going to help, uh, but I think that, that there is definitely more to come on the lending facility front as well. So let me stop there and then um, pass it back to you, Stuart. Thank you, Julie. A very good uh, overview and uh, indeed raising a bunch of issues as to where we might go with this uh, in, the, in the future and the you know, consistent use of new tools and innovative tools and, and your point about uh, supporting, uh, uh, supporting uh, small businesses but also consumers and so on through the banks, through supervisory action is very sensible and appropriate as well. And I would note that uh, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer in his press conference this afternoon announced that the he had got an agreement with the British banks that in the UK there would be a three-month mortgage holiday in order to in order to help relieve that pressure that you described on on uh, average uh, average uh, earners who who are feeling unable to pay that may be unable to pay those mortgages and those loans and so on. So very good. I know there will be a lot of questions now, uh, Megan. If I can hand over to you to give us a sense of where monetary policy is uh, from the international standpoint, Megan, please. 
Sure, I'd be happy to. I think it's worth pointing out that aside from the U.S., if you're looking at the rest of the globe, um, we weren't coming at this from a strong position before the virus hit. So I'll just highlight that Italy and France were contracting, Germany was stagnating, uh, Japan was contracting. Um, so it wasn't exactly a picture on health before the virus hit. Um, now that we've had the coronavirus hit and uh, much of Europe has been completely shut down, um, some borders have been reinstated, um, we have gotten some policy reaction and Julia was talking about some new tools that we might have in monetary policy. Um, I think we should look to Europe for some of those actually. So investors were uh, pretty disappointed by the ECB's latest move, um, but I think, I think that's because they've missed something. So. The ECB um, left rates where they were, and that's what really disappointed people. But, of course, the ECB already has negative rates. So um, that does suggest that cutting rates even more negative um, might not be helpful and might be counterproductive. Um, but what they did do was announce an, an extra 120 billion euros in quantitative easing by the end of the year. And they've clarified to say that um, normally QE has to be according to the capital key, and the capital key is determined by the size of an economy roughly. So that means the ECB can buy up mostly German bonds and next French and next Italian bonds um, and so on according to the size of the economy. Um, and so that really constrains the ECB. But uh, they've been clear that actually they just need to hit that capital key over time. So you can kind of average it out, which means that Italian yields, for example, given Italy is sort of at the epicenter of this in Europe, if they spike, and the ECB can go in aggressively to bring down Italian yields to key as long as they even out the capital key over the rest of the year. Um, they also announced lower counter cyclical buffers. Um, and then most importantly, the ECB announced a new targeted long-term refinancing operation for SMEs, um, and so the, the shorthand for that is an, a Teltro. And what they did, which is really important, is they um, they made this Teltro uh, up to 75 basis points lower than the deposit rate. And in doing that, they essentially introduced a second interest rate, a dual interest rate. Uh, and that could be monetary policy rocket fuel if used correctly. This is just kind of the establishment of it. Um, but what it means is that in the future, they can go ahead and offer these Teltros to banks at deeply negative rates. And that means that banks can borrow from the ECB and get paid for it. Um, and then the, because they're targeted, they have to go on and lend to certain parts of the economy. So this time it's to SMEs. And they can um, go on and extend those loans um, at less negative rates. Uh, so the banks can benefit from a carry trade. Um, borrowers get subsidized massively. And then, you know, savers aren't penalized with lower rates. Um, because you've created this second interest rate. So what you can end up doing is benefiting both borrowers and savers, and that's an unambiguous stimulus across the economy. The problem with the Teltro is that, um, you know, banks might not be interested in lending to companies that have just seen their revenues come to a screeching halt. Um, and in order to kind of unlock that transmission mechanism, what you really need to see is governments providing um, low loss guarantees. And Christine Lagarde, the president of the ECB, suggested this, but that's not all she can do. Um, some individual countries have come out and announced them. Germany, the country that none of us thought would ever um, get off their heels in terms of fiscal stimulus, they, they announced some limited credit to SMEs via the state bank and, and loan guarantees. So that's pretty powerful. And we've also seen loan guarantees come out of France. And so that could encourage more take up of these cultures and, and could help get more targeted loans out um, because we're trying to hit kind of individuals, households, and SMEs with very top down tools. So this is this could be one way to do it. So um, one you know one thing we could see in the future is using these cultures um, more frequently. We could also see the ECB scrap its issuer limits. So it set up limits on how much is each company's uh, sorry, each country's debt it can buy. Um, and they're totally self-imposed. Uh, and as it turns out, the ECB is almost at its limit for Germany and the Netherlands. So they could just scrap those, those limits, which would allow them to buy much more sovereign debt, and that could help if yield starts to increase. Um, otherwise, you know, one option is yield curve control. If you were to see Italy's yield spike and the ECB gets kind of caught up in the capital key and can't target Italy specifically anymore, it could follow in the Bank of Japan's footsteps and engage in yield curve control, but that's really tricky because how do you do yield curve control with a capital key? You probably can't. You would have to scrap the capital key, and politically, that's, that's just not on the table. 
at the moment. There's one other tool that we could see the ECB use, with, which is the OMT, Outright Monetary Transactions. It was a measure announced by Draghi after his Whatever It Takes speech back in 2012, um, but it's never been used. Essentially, it's a bailout financed by the ESM and the ECB with very strict conditions. So it's a, it's a bailout clause. Um, and, you know, it, we'll see how bad things get, but in the past, Italy has been up for an OMT and refused one uh, because they didn't want to accept the conditionality. And I keep highlighting Italy because Italy is at the epicenter of this, but also Italy's public debt burden is, is huge. Um, Julia highlighted that, you know, we probably can't just do all this with um, monetary policy. We're going to need fiscal policy, too. And there, Europe is no different. There was a Eurogroup meeting yesterday, and uh, the conclusions were fantastically lackluster. Um, essentially, they scrapped some of the um, fiscal rules, but they didn't fully suspend the Stability and Growth Pact, which I think they're going to have to do. They announced, um, they didn't announce, they kind of summarized the 1% of Eurozone GDP in fiscal stimulus that has already been announced by national capitals. So the message there was kind of we can't do a whole lot at the European level over to you, national capitals, which is um, to be expected. The EU is not fantastic at coordinating in terms of fiscal stimulus, but it is nevertheless disappointing. Uh, the European Investment Bank announced $8 billion in loan guarantees. That's great, but will have to be scaled up massively. And there is a $37 billion Euro dollar coronavirus fund. So. These measures uh, are a step in the right direction, but don't go nearly far enough. Um, the Bank of England also uh, has announced some changes. They cut interest rates, unlike ECB, but the Bank of England had interest rates in positive territory, so they cut by 50 basis points. Um, they also reduced countercyclical buffers, um, you know, have encouraged uh, banks to provide leniency for loan repayments, um, and also they set up a term funding scheme for SMEs which um, is basically a Teltro just um, in the UK. Um, interestingly, the Bank of England coordinated its announcement with the Treasury Department, and that is the kind of coordination that we would like to see. Um, so far, the UK is really the only one who's done it. Um, but the Treasury came out and uh, announced a budget. Uh, that was six days ago, so right before this call. They, they announced another one, so that's how fast things are really moving here. But in the latest one, even though the loan loss guarantees of 330 billion pounds, which is um, pretty impressive, uh, I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, there's also an expansion of subsidies for sick pay, mortgage holidays, as Stuart pointed out, um, tax holidays for small businesses, and some stimulus. So I do think that fiscal policy is, is a bit um, more constructive in terms of trying to support monetary policy in the UK than we've seen anywhere else. The Bank of Japan. Um, has stepped in and doubled its annual purchase of equities. That means that by the end of the year, it might take over the GPIF, the, the National Pension Fund, as the biggest holder of domestic stocks. Um, so the Bank of Japan is a real trailblazer on that one. Um, and they announced uh, a new lending facility offering loans to businesses in exchange for corporate debt. Um, on the fiscal side in Japan, we've seen some loan uh, loss guarantees, um, $19 billion roughly in stimulus measures, and there's talk of uh, cutting taxes. Of course, Japan went into contraction at the end of last year in large part because they hiked taxes. And so the Bank of Japan didn't cut rates. Again, it already has rates in negative territory, and so it does speak to the idea that negative rates, um, you know, making them even more negative probably wouldn't help. Um, in China, where, uh, of course, this entire crisis um, hit first, We've seen some measures come out of the PBOC, the central bank. We've seen a bunch of liquidity operations, a number of rate cuts, particularly reserve requirement ratio rate cuts. Um, we've seen uh, the cap on foreign debt purchases increase and um, some loans to SMEs. So the monetary and fiscal response has to be huge there. And I would highlight we've gotten some hard data out of China that does reflect the coronavirus, unlike the data that we're getting in the Western world, um, a few days ago, we saw investment sell 24.5% year and year in January, February this year. Factory output fell 13.5%. Retail sales fell around 20%. Um, we also saw their PMI data crater to the lowest ever in February. So China is going to try to simulate its economy now that the virus is um, seemingly on its way to being contained. 
Um, but now China is facing a really weak global backdrop, and so that will constrain um, China's recovery, certainly. And then finally, just really quickly, in emerging markets, um, a number of central banks have cut rates, but I would just highlight that, um, as Julia highlighted, with some of what the Fed is doing, is down to a shortage of U.S. dollars. And last week, we saw the biggest rally in the U.S. dollar in nearly five years. Um, that puts a real squeeze on emerging markets, um, many of which have issued debt in U.S. dollars and invoiced their trade in U.S. dollars. And compounding all of this is capital outflows from emerging markets towards safe havens in the face of this. So we're going to need to see more central banks um, and also fiscal policy action in emerging markets as well. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Megan. That was excellent uh, to the force of what's going on internationally. Maybe I can uh, uh, start st start it off and come back to you, Megan. You you uh, you described the response, the fiscal response in the European Union, as fantastically sort of lackluster, the coordinated response. Maybe if I can widen it out a bit and say, how do you how, do, how are you viewing the response internationally? To this crisis when you compare it to the response in 08 09 to the global financial crisis when 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 it seems at least that there was a much greater degree of coordination in the res in the response not only of the central banks but also the governments and fiscal uh, authorities i are you pleased with the level of coordination right now or do you think it's lacking this is a great question, and I would say we're a bit earlier on in this crisis to be able to um, give the final word on what's happened with international coordination. I've been disappointed by the coordination between central banks and fiscal authorities within countries. I'm even more disappointed with the coordination that we're seeing globally, but that um, shouldn't come as much of a surprise just given um, the kind of go-it-alone attitude that a lot of countries have adopted. Um, it's difficult, you know, this might finally, at some point, if it gets bad enough, spark everyone to kind of roll in the same direction. But so far, we've seen, you know, China provide masks to Italy, which on the one hand is helpful. On the other hand, Italy did sign up to the Belt and Road Initiative. So maybe that's, um, that's sort of a reward for joining China's sphere of influence. We've seen President Trump announce that, or, or we've seen reports at least that he was trying to um, gets the vaccine that's being made in Germany available only for the U.S. Um, so we are starting to see the beginnings of purely domestic uh, responses. And I think given the, the truly global nature of this crisis, um, we're going to need to cooperate if we want to be able to flatten the recession curve as much as we would all like to. Unfortunately, I just don't think that will probably happen. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Maybe I can uh, come to you, Julia, with a question. And this is uh, going back to what you said at the outset, where you're absolutely right. This is, you know, it's a medical crisis, first and foremost, a sudden stop uh, demanded by the actions to, to, to halt the pandemic, to flatten the curve. And as a result, you get a sudden stop in the economy. Does this mean then if we're trying to see a, 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 a slightly positive uh, spin on it, that because of that nature, once we get once once we once we see the the crest of the infections uh, and go over the crest and on the, are on the downside, that the recovery will be much faster than was the case in, in the response to the GFC in 2008. Um, so I think that's a great question. Uh, I would say make two points with that. I mean. Um, one is it will still depend on the epidemiology. So if we're flattening the curve uh, and we're successful, which isn't clear yet, but if, if we are, uh, then we will, um, and I think Dr. Anthony Fauci said this uh, in the press conference today, we're not going to see, you know, a crest and then a, a sudden decline. You're going to see a long plateau at the top, right, uh, which would mean an extended period of interruption. Um, and there's also the possibility that um, what we're going to see is a, a lull in the summertime. There, there is some evidence, it's not clear because this is a unique virus, but uh, that you might get some lull in the summer months. And then it spikes again in the fall. So I think um, 
uh, one, we, it's uncertain because we need to know the epidemiology and, and how long the disruptions in some of the activity. I suspect the social distancing may not be as acute as it is right now, but as we resume activity, we may still do it tentatively and with lots of precautions. Uh, and so, um, I, so I don't think we're going to come, say, roaring back in a few months. Um, the other thing is that uh, when you have interruptions in discretionary activity like this, uh, that um, a lot of the spending uh, that doesn't happen never comes back. So um, I would differentiate between things like, let's say, uh, a car purchase that you're delaying because you just don't think it's the right time to go out and shop for a car uh, and you're, you're uh, quarantining. So we're likely to see a decline in auto sales in the near term. Most of the auto industry is expecting that. <laughs> and some of those auto sales will come back. They will come back in the second half. But the vacations not taken, the restaurant meals not eaten, the basketball games and baseball games not attended, that spending is gone. Um, there's some offset from, you know, spending on food at home and stocking up, uh, but I think there's a net loss that will just be gone. Um, and we will see, the problem is, too, we are almost, without a doubt, we already know based on um, state experiences that we are going to see a spike in unemployment uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to see a spike in jobless claims. We will see people losing their jobs, and there's a multiplier effect to that. So um, I don't think it's just going to be a transitory, you know, V-shape. We're going to shut down for a month and then come roaring back. I think this is going to be a recession. I think it's going to be a decline in activity of two quarters and a rise in unemployment rate of at least a half a percent. Uh, I think. There is, in contrast to the GFC, we don't have sort of a, a, a bad loan overhang inherently. Policy needs to make sure that that doesn't happen. That is, you know, people don't lose their homes or, or get evicted from their apartments uh, or see their credit quality deteriorate. I think they're, we're starting to see policy kind of address that. So we won't have that multiple year overhang uh, that dragged us down in the recovery from the GFC. Um, we had an effectively a pretty healthy U.S. economy going into this. But I do think that the disruptions, I think we should think about a term of somewhat like a year uh, before the virus has truly played out through the population until we've developed some precautions and, some, and a vaccine will take even longer. I mean, eventually we will you know, be in decent shape, but I think there's going to be some ripple effects and it really true, it will be a true recession first. That's sobering. Thank you, uh, Julia. Let me turn it back uh, now uh, to, to Megan and add, but, but to both of you to answer this with perhaps Megan coming in first. And so you, you both implied in, and, and didn't just imply, you both mentioned in your remarks on the U.S. and also internationally that there was a necessity for the, for the central banks to target their uh, their support. Now, I could be a bit Germanic about it and say, well, uh, you know, is that the business of the Fed, is that the business of the central banks to pick pick winners? Some people would say, no, you shouldn't get in the in that business. How do you how do you respond to that? That we're essentially pursuing, starting to get central banks to pursue what, what is sort of industrial policy in extremis, uh, Megan. So I would say it's not a first best solution. Um, the first best solution would be for fiscal authorities to make decisions about allocation rather than central banks doing it. Um, you know, it is very difficult for what it's worth for fiscal authorities to target things too. We, we only have top-down rules on both the monetary and the fiscal policy side. So um, that is the difficulty here. But um, it would be better if fiscal authorities we're leading the charge on how to allocate um, all this money. Um, in the absence of that, and so far the fiscal response has been kind of piecemeal and a little bit behind the curve, um, you know, the second best option is for central banks to step in and do it. And, um, you know, for political reasons, they can often act faster 
Um, and so that's to some degree what we're seeing with these things like Caltrans and term funding schemes for SMEs. Uh, we need to get money to SMEs that are um, struggling and will struggle for just a quarter or two until this is contained and, and then otherwise are perfectly healthy businesses um, and also individuals who are facing the same kind of sudden stop in income. Um, so it would be great if the fiscal authorities were willing to do it, but absent that, uh, central banks can be helpful there. Uh, thank, thank you, Megan. Uh, Julia, do, do you do you have how 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 would you respond to to, to those who are critical of uh, the, the central bank picking uh, picking winners, as it were, or is, are we in such a severe circumstance that we just need we just need to go ahead and do it? So, and I, I presume that you're for for this, it would be you know with with regards to say bailing out the airlines and or the cruise ships and or you know those those types of businesses that are so acutely affected they could be staring at bankruptcy and, and possibly a funding facility. Um, right. I do think that um, you know we are seeing action on the fiscal side. So most appropriately, that's a political decision taken by fiscal authorities in terms of choosing who to bail out and who not to. Um, and we are seeing, you know, things like the, the tax delays that were announced today. Um, that's a fiscal response. That's, it, it's for everybody, but obviously it's the biggest benefit to the people most impacted, like um, the airlines. So I do, and then they've talked about loan guarantees. So I think some of this can come on the fiscal side. I think that's always an issue for the Fed. Um, so, you know, we'll see how some of these facilities are structured. So, for example, if you're thinking about creating a, uh, you know, a municipal bond facility, that's a, a concern. Um, although, again, I think in this circumstance, it's entirely appropriate as a public health issue uh, to have it be open to any sort of um, creditworthy borrower uh, who are, is issuing to address the coronavirus outbreak. So. There are ways to, I think, generalize it. And that was, of course, the intent of the, um, the Dodd-Frank legislation that said any such facility has to have at least five counterparties. So I think that's always an issue. I think the Fed is very concerned about the optics of that, um, not just the optics, but the substance of that. Um, but, you know, again, we are in unusual and exigent circumstances, so you may have to, there may be some element to, to, to that. I think I have seen both the Fed and, and talking to people on Capitol Hill, um, there's a real desire this time to keep an eye on making sure that whatever stimulus passes, it is getting at least as much, if not more, to the real economy as to any financial institution. Um, uh, and that is why, for example, I think even Congress is contemplating action on um, allowing the Fed to be more on the municipal bond financing front. We, we need, again, this is a real economy shock. We need money in the pockets of state and local governments, households, um, affected small businesses and large businesses. Um, it really isn't a banking crisis this time around, and there are ways to prevent it from becoming a banking crisis. So I think that makes that concern, you know, less salient because we really don't, it really isn't a banking problem anyway. Thank you, Julia. Um, maybe I can uh, maybe I can turn uh, sort of uh, back 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 to you both and sort of give you more space to talk about whether you're seeing on the fiscal side, both of which you touched on as being a, a, an essential sort of prerequisite or partner to the to the monetary policy efforts. Uh, is what you're seeing on the fiscal side yet what you expect to see and need to see as economists so that we get the necessary bounce if and when the if and when the lockdown on the economies around the world are are, are, are relieved somewhat. In other words, are, 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 are you looking at this from a positive perspective, or, or are you disappointed by the the announcements so far? Uh, Megan, do you want to try that? Sure. Um, so I would say the one country that has beaten my expectations would be Germany, <laughs> um, which you know none of us ever really thought would offer unlimited credit to anyone ever. Um, 
And by the way, they don't actually have to borrow that much uh, more in order to do that just because the KFW has a lot of funds already. But um, that was a positive surprise. That being said, it doesn't go nearly far enough. So, I mean, I think what we need to see, not just in Europe but across the board, um, is um, loan guarantees. Um, and significant ones. So what the UK has just done, uh, the £330 billion pounds loan loss guarantees, I think that was a shock and odd figure. I mean, you could see everybody come up with um, something similar to that. Um, and we also, I think, need to figure out how to react really quickly to this, given that I mentioned we have top-down tools, trying to kind of ferret out who, you know, where the Uber driver is, who doesn't have fares to concerts anymore, and who the guy who runs a coffee stand in Manhattan is who doesn't have traffic going past because nobody's going to work anymore. Um, that's really difficult. So I think what we need to do is get cash to everyone immediately. And it looks like the U.S. is finally um, starting to discuss that. Um, so we'll see. The jury's still out. But I, I, we would need to see that, I think. And um, that would go in the U.S. and everywhere else. That would go a long way towards helping people who um, have lost their incomes or don't have an income because they self-quarantined um, and need to make their rent payments or pay bills or buy food. Um, I think that would really help. Um, now, a lot of people won't spend that money, um, particularly as we're all on lockdown. Um, but once the virus is contained and um, things start to return to some sort of normalcy, uh, they probably will, and that will just help the recovery once it's starting anyhow. So. Um, I think that's already useful. So I think what we need to do in the first instance is address the health issue, of course, um, support our healthcare workers, um, provide as much money as they need to do, uh, what they need to do in order to, to contain this. But then secondly, we need to get cash to everyone, I think, pretty quickly. And thirdly, we need to provide targeted measures. Um, and we seem to be looking at targeted measures a, a bit earlier. Thank you, Megan. So on um, the U.S., there. I would say Sorry, that, yeah, sure. The, on the U.S., I would say um, the fiscal response has been um, not as, you know, it's been slow. It always is. It always, the initial response is always to get bogged down in, in partisan uh, fighting. That seems to be melting, <laughs> melting with markets, and so... Um, we are seeing greater political will, just seeing headlines today of a package of $1.2 trillion with a substantial upfront cash component for consumers, like Meg suggested, um, is necessary. So we're seeing some very positive movements on the fiscal front, which, which will be essential for sort of short-circuiting this shock from transmitting into, you know, a much deeper recession. Um, so that's positive. I think $1.2 trillion, we're starting to talk about the kind of amounts that we need to talk about to address this. Um, on, the, on the disease side, I would say, you know, it, it is uh, starting to improve, but it still um, has been uniquely disappointing in the U.S. and is still quite a necessary component um, to addressing this. So, We've seen, I can contra we can contrast the U.S. response um, to countries like South Korea and Singapore where they just um, made very widespread testing available. Anybody who was positive, they carefully tracked their, who they've been in contact with and did um, very aggressive but targeted quarantining um, and managed to flatten the curve uh, quickly and aggressively in terms of the transmission of the disease and therefore didn't see as sharp a stop in economic, economic activity as we're seeing in Europe and the U.S. Um, the U.S. has been made bad decisions about testing availability and um, really played politics with the situation. Uh, and we still, they're still, they're giving, they're just lying about testing availability in press conferences. Um, it still is the state. Actually, Politico has a really nice coronavirus tracker by state where you can see how many people have been tested, how many have tested positive, and how many deaths there have been. It's the best data that I can see. You know, Johns Hopkins has a tracker globally. Um, we, we don't have transparency or unique data from the, um, uh, from the federal government. And 
the states that have been aggressively testing are states that have created their own test and um, and, to, and their own test protocol and criteria. Um, so, for example, in Washington State, it's more than 10 to 1, the number of people tested to the number who've tested positive. In states like Texas, where I am right now, the only people that have been tested have tested positive because their criteria is so extremely restrictive. So that's unacceptable. Um, we're not going to get through the economic interruption unless we can test very broadly and really do more targeted quarantining and flatten this curve and limit the spread and not overwhelm the healthcare system. All of that is essential to dovetailing into a more limited economic hit. So I would say we are still, we've seen some improvement on that front, um, but it is still really lagging and very disappointing in the U.S. Thank you, thank you. We have, we have, as you say, an earlier months and months to go uh, in the best case scenarios. Let, let me, uh, I know we're coming close to, to the end, but I want to uh, pass a question on to Megan and ask, uh, ask you, Megan, whether you have a view on uh, the prospects in India. How is India handling this? They are just starting to test and seem to see uh, a large increase in the number of people testing positive. Uh, are you confident that they uh, are able, will be able to handle it in the same degree of dispa dispatch as China did, for instance? So I'm going to have to confess that I haven't been focused on India much at all <laughs> um, over the past a week or so, so I can't speak to the latest things they've done, but I, I mean, I will say that India is um, not unique in EM for having a lot of U.S. dollar denominated, um, not only debt, but uh, even more so in uh, trade invoice in U.S. dollars, and so this dollar shortage, which hopefully should be eased by um, Fed swap lines globally um, that, you know, that could be a squeeze on the Indian economy. But in terms of the policy response, I'm sorry, I haven't really been following you closely. Understood. Let, let, me, let me put one final question to both of you. Um, you know, before this pandemic broke, a lot of people, when they were looking at the risk, the risk um, landscape ahead, would point to the very high levels of corporate and also sovereign debt, but, but certainly corporate debt all over the world, not just in the United States. Should we be more worried about that now because of the economic effects of the pandemic that we see unfolding today and which may unfold for some months to come? Julia, is that, is that a risk to yes. of, of further damage? <laughs> yes, and it is part of our expectations that we're building in for the recession. Um, we'd always talked about, you know, the, the Fed's assessment had been you know, they've been saying, we see, we see the elevated corporate debt levels. Um, they don't appear to be sort of a systemic risk like in 2008 that they themselves, that leverage can be the cause of a recession. But it will no doubt be an accelerant in a downturn. And I think the clearest industry um, that, will, that we will see that is in the energy industry. So oil prices may came, come off the lows, but they're going to be low for a while and the energy industry was already struggling with prices sort of around 50. So now that we're around 30, you are going to see some default and some deleveraging in the energy sector, and that will lead to declining investment, and that will hit different regional economies harder. Uh, so I think that that's the clearest example of where we will see that debt burden, you know, over, over leveraged companies, um, you know, being, you, you'll see that cascading effect, and I don't think that, you know, bailing out companies that aren't viable at $30 a barrel oil is, is a very different proposition than bailing out companies that are, um, could go bankrupt uh, because of an interruption in travel that are otherwise, you know, healthy and solvent. Um, so I, I think that that's, uh, an industry that is going to get hit and will, and will hit investment, and there will be kind of that more uh, regional recessionary dynamic in certain areas. Um, and there are other companies. So the tech sector is an area where it's not just the debt, but also the private equity. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, very uh, 
uh, optimistic assumptions in in investments uh, of late. And if this does last kind of on a lingering basis globally, you may see that availability of funding um, not return to where we were six months ago, and therefore you could have some default and some pullback there. So I do think it's going to be an accelerant. It's one reason that I don't think there's any way to avoid a recession at this point. Um, I don't think it's necessarily, again, does not put us in a GFC type of situation, uh, but it does mean that we this shock will transmit into a recession dynamic. Thank you. Yeah, Megan, are there other particular, particular regions or countries that you're concerned about from a corporate debt perspective, sovereign debt perspective? Um, no, I would echo that you know, we've been worried about corporate debt in the U.S. for ages, and we all thought that maybe rates going up would be the trigger. That's clearly not happening. Um, none of us had foreseen this as being the trigger, but having you know all that triple B debt downgraded at once will absolutely flood the high yield market and cause dislocation. So, um, I agree with Julia that that will probably exacerbate the downturn. Um, in terms of, I'm not as worried about corporate debt elsewhere, and um, there are big worries about sovereign debt, um, both in the U.S. and also in Europe and Japan, but I will say that central banks have essentially just stepped in and guaranteed that rates will be you know, pretty much at zero or below for the foreseeable future. So I, I think that makes it inexcusable uh, for governments not to um, pick up the baton uh, and take that as a call to action for fiscal stimulus. So, you know, in normal times, you might worry about the sovereign debt burden globally, but I think um, now we need to dismiss it given that rates are so low. Um, and, you know, rates being low will help some some companies um, manage their debt servicing as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, I take your point. In, 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 when faced with the emergency, you need to act and uh, worry a little bit later on some of these things. Uh, I think we've come to the end, and I want to thank uh, Julia, and I want to also thank you, Megan, for doing this. Uh, I think it's been, uh, it's been excellent and, uh, and very enjoyable. I just want to hand over to Chris Jonas if there are any f final uh, comments. Chris? Yes, thanks, Stuart, and thanks, Julia and Megan. I want to thank you all for joining today. Uh, today's program is Copyright 2020 by the National Association for Business Economics with All Rights Reserved. This does conclude the event. We will see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you. This concludes today's event. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>